Welcome back to the factory. Since we saw you last, we've been working on some Makerverse kits and we've also got a new Picadev prototype to show off. Let's get into it. First up, a bit of release news. The Picadev real-time clock has been released. If you weren't familiar with this project, this is a supercapacitor backed up real-time clock so that you don't have to worry about using batteries. The supercapacitor charges when connected to power and we'll keep it backed up for about a week at a time. With this module comes a brand new guide experience. For previous Picadev modules, we would create a separate video and a separate guide for each development platform that it was compatible with. So at the time of writing Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi Pico, and Microbit. That means that to complete your first project using a piece of Picadev hardware, you would select your dev board and go off to whichever guide was appropriate. Now Picadev does a great job of unifying experiences across these platforms so that the code just always looks the same no matter which platform you're on. But this separate guide experience means that if we need to make any little change, we have to change it in three places. The Picadev RTC is the first module where we're trying out a new style of guide where we have all three development boards available within that one guide. And here's the experience. You start off with the getting started guide and the first thing you, that you do is select which dev board you're working on. By default, we're showing Raspberry Pi Pico to start, but you can jump over to the Raspberry Pi or Microbit tabs and see the video content for those development boards. And this is true at any point in the guide where there's a different action depending on which development board you're using. For example, a really clear case is for the Raspberry Pi Pico, you would connect your development board in a certain way and that's gonna be different to how the micro bit looks. Likewise, for that first time setup where you might be programming something in Thony, we can just expand the tab to show what is essentially like a mini guide or an aside for people that have never followed that step before. And if you have, then it's very easy to click off it and proceed with the guide. But that means that all the content to get started is within the same page. There's no linking off to different development boards and no linking off to other assumed knowledge like how to program in Thony. I'll include a link to this guide in this video. If you happen to follow along, we'd love to hear your feedback on how we can make it even better. Now in previous Factor episodes, we've shown you loads of hardware prototypes for lots of different Makerverse modules. Things like amplifiers, keyboards, load cell, ADCs, where are these pieces of hardware? Well, we've been saving them because we wanted to deliver a kitted Makerverse experience. You know, considered by themselves, these modules are perhaps a little esoteric and intimidating for beginners. You kind of know what an audio amplifier might do or maybe what a DAC might do, but for a beginner starting a project that they know they want to include sound in that somehow, it can be a little bit intimidating to scrape together these disparate, uh, unconnected pieces of hardware to get a result. And so we're going to release these modules all at once in a kitted experience. This is the Makerverse audio kit, which is just one example of the kits we've been working on. And we think that this will provide a much more cohesive experience for people that want to include audio in their projects, where you can make something from scratch that will play audio. In this case, this kit will provide a keyboard to play some sounds manually, or you'll be able to play audio off a SD card. Opening up the kit, this has a lot of the hardware that we've been talking about in previous episodes, things like the SD card module, the R2R DAC, of course, an audio amplifier, and the 8-key keyboard. So the kitting is complete for this kit and two others, and we're working on the education right now, so stay tuned for more Makerverse kits and let us know what project you think we should work on in the future. And in the world of Picadev prototypes, we're working on a Picadev air quality sensor. This one is based off the ENS160 from Sciasense. And this is a pretty straightforward design. We've, we've got designing Picadev modules pretty down now. We were able to template that process quite well. But this story is more about component selection. In the Picadev environmental sensing lineup, we already have the BME280, which is a temperature, pressure, and humidity sensor. That's made by Bosch. And Bosch also make the BME680, which was originally getting a, a thorough look in for this project. This, this device is used for measuring indoor air quality as well. But you know, the further you go down the rabbit hole in these data sheets, you can sometimes uncover something that is a real make or break for whether you go forward with a project. So of course the BME 680, it measures indoor air quality. That's, you know, uh, volatile organic compounds or equivalent CO2. But as we get down to that application, we can see that it's going to rely on smart algorithms inside something called BSEC. Now following that trail of breadcrumbs a little further, we can see that BSEC is actually a closed source binary 
which Bosch distribute for use on embedded systems or microcontrollers. So this is their, their pre-baked binary that will do the, the smart algorithms to calculate things like indoor air quality, equivalent CO2, et cetera. That's kind of a deal breaker for platforms like Picadev, which are first, first and foremost, like completely open source. It also means that there's a, a new file dependency if it were to be implemented, which uh, could maybe harm the user experience. And so getting back into the parts discovery led me to the ENS160, where if you just take a look at the simple register mapping, there it is. We have air quality index as a register. You just read it. The same with uh, organic volatile compounds and equivalent CO2. And so of course, there are already internationally developed standards for how to interpret those like one number readings. Here we've got the equivalent CO2 and you can see that we just have a couple of ranges. We've got 400 to 600 is excellent all the way down to greater than 1500 is bad. So there's probably even some scope in the API to just extract the rating as a word rather than a number if you just want to display which band you're in. So just that difference in like API requirements will change the development time required for these devices. It, it could be quite significant. It appears that developing this API would be really straightforward because you just need to initialize and then read from the sensor. Whereas working with the BME part, who knows what you're in for with that pre-compiled binary that you have no access to to see what's going on. So it looks like a very friendly part to use the ENS160. It does have a requirement for an extra voltage system on board. But hey, that's no big deal. It's pretty easy to put a linear voltage regulator on there. Otherwise, it's a pretty straightforward design. And that's a wrap for this episode. If you wanna see something a little bit closer or if you have some questions, leave us a comment or open a thread on the Core Electronics forums. Until next time, catch you later.